I am really pleased that we are able to have Reverend Dr. Bill Schultz with us this evening. He is the president. He is the president of the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee. He is the past president of Amnesty International and also of the Unitarian Universalist Association. In fact, he was president when I first started working as a religious educator in the late 1980s. So it's great to have you here, Bill. Come on up and looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Dory. Uh, that's the kind of introduction I like, short and sweet. I, introductions make me very nervous. Ever since I heard of one that was given to the last Unitarian President of the United States. Who was that? You remember? Yeah. Exactly. William Howard Taft. Very large man. 380 pounds. And an industrial magnate of the era named Chauncey Depew once introduced President Taft by saying, Ladies and gentlemen, the truth is that President Taft is pregnant. <laughs> and I guess President Taft had a very good sense of humor because he got up and he said, yes, it's true, I am pregnant. And if it is a boy, we will name it after me. If it is a girl, we will name it after my wife, Helen. But if, as I suspect, it is nothing but a bag of wind, we will name it Chauncey Depew. <laughs> It's, it's really a delight for me to be here. I do have uh, deep roots in the central Midwest area. My grandfather was for 17 years treasurer of the Unitarian Church in Urbana, Illinois. And every year, at the end of the year, he paid the church deficit out of his own pocket, which is why he kept getting reelected <laughs> for 17 years. And then, of course, I graduated from Meadville Lombard, and I teach at Meadville Lombard. And by the way, those of you who are interested in learning more about Meadville Lombard, Justine is here. Where are you, Justine? In the back, and she has a table to tell you all about Meadville Lombard. So I feel very much at home here among you, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, what I'm going to do this evening is to talk about three elements of Unitarian Universalist faith, three passions that never die, of which I think we are in particular need right now in this country. But before I do that, I have to pause for an advertisement, because I am, after all, the president of the UU Service Committee. And the truth is that only about one out of every five Unitarian Universalists is a member of the Service Committee. That's an astonishing number to me. Women in refugee camps in Darfur, Sudan, should not be raped by the United Nations police who are put in those camps to protect them. But that's what happened before the service committee designed a training, evaluation, and monitoring program for those police that was adopted by the United Nations. You did that, hmm. you and UUSC. <clears throat> workers in poultry factories in Arkansas should not have their wages stolen from them by the large poultry companies simply because those workers are undocumented and are therefore afraid to go to the authorities. But that is what happened until UUSC and its partners in Arkansas put a stop to it. You did that, you and UUSC. Mayan Indians in Guatemala should not have to live with toxins in their water because a large mining company named Gold Core cares more for profits than it does for people. Well, UUSC has taken Gold Core to court, to the Inter-American Court for Human Rights, and just this afternoon, Gold Core announced that it had given in, it is putting $27 million to reclaim the mine that has been leaching toxins into the water. You did that yesterday. <laughs> And nowhere are you doing that more consistently and dramatically than in Haiti. You heard earlier about the new UUA, UUSC initiative that we call the College of Social Justice. We are bringing dozens and dozens of Unitarian Universalists to work 
with us in Haiti to build eco-villages in the Central Plateau, to re-timber the land in Haiti, to create economic cooperatives in Haiti, to put Haiti back together again after the earthquake that occurred two years ago. And the College of Social Justice over the next few years is going to make it possible for literally thousands of Unitarian Universalists, congregations, UU young people, UU seminarians, to work with us to put our Unitarian Universalist values to work, to do what the late great evangelical preacher Reverend Ike called tangibilitating your Unitarian Universalist values. It's an exciting new initiative. It's a new day at UUSC in so many ways, and I hope that you will want to be a part of it. Membership is only $40. If you give us $100 or more, it is matched dollar for dollar by our congregation in Shelter Rock, New York. That's not too much, I think, to do to tangibilitate our values both here and around the world. But now, back to our regularly scheduled program. <laughs> we are witness today to an enormous struggle in this world between those who would close down culture, close down inquiry, limit it to the familiar, to the traditional, to the comfortable, and those who try at least to be open to new worlds, to new evidence, to new faith. It's a struggle between those who fear the stranger and those who would embrace the new neighbor. It's a struggle for, between those who believe that the future is fated, determined, and those who know that history is in human hands, that there is indeed good reason to hope. It is, in short, a struggle between a parched vision and a generous heart. And for better or worse, Unitarian Universalism has always cast its lot, or tried to at least, on the side of the generous heart. And at the center of that generous heart, a passion that never dies, is the conviction that truth takes many forms, that wisdom comes in many guises, that love manifests itself in many ways, that the truth comes from a myriad of sources, not just one, not just one authority. Vladimir Putin doesn't believe that. Rush Limbaugh doesn't believe that. Pope Benedict doesn't believe that. Opponents of gender equality don't believe that. Judge Judy doesn't believe that. <laughs> but it is true. Now, I admit that sometimes I wish it weren't true. Sometimes I wish the secret of life was a lot simpler than it is. The Chinese philosopher Hong Chong Cheng once said, only those who can appreciate the least palatable of root vegetables can possibly know the meaning of life. <laughs> I wish it were that easy. <laughs> what is a human being, said the Danish novelist, Isak Dinesen, what is a human being but an elaborate machine for turning red wine into urine? <laughs> I wish that was all there is to it. But I have been telling this story for 40 years, and I'm going to tell it again because my sympathies on this question lie with the rabbi who upon his deathbed was asked by the head elder to reveal the meaning of life before he passed Young. Life, said the rabbi, is like a river. And those wise words were passed on down the row of elders. The rabbi says life is like a river until they reach the lowest of the low, the poor, stupid Shlemiel. But the Shlemiel was puzzled. What does the rabbi mean, life is like the river, said the Shlemiel. And that question was passed on back up the row of elders until it reached the head elder who put it to the rabbi. Oh, I'm so sorry, good sir, he said, but the poor stupid Shlemiel has asked, what do you mean life is like a river? But the rabbi just shrugged. So he said, life is not like a river. <laughs> comes in a variety of guises. Love presents itself in many different fashions. That's a conviction this faith has taught for 400 
years. It's a conviction that is needed now more than ever. Then there is a second feature of that generous heart, and that is the recognition that what human beings share is far broader and more important than what divides us. And though the truth does take a myriad of forms, there is one truth, one truth that remains beyond dispute, and that is that all blood flows red, that more profound than all our differences is our common suffering. And that what Man. will save this planet right. is a recognition of the frailty yes. that we share. Amen. I want to talk for a few minutes about immigration. I want to talk about it, of course, because it is much on our minds with the General Assembly coming up in Arizona. But I want to talk about it because it is a test case of our faith. It is a complicated question. Unitarian Universalists of good faith come out on both sides of the issue. But we need to understand how important this issue is if for no other reason than that our faith is a product of it. For when in the mid-1600s, the Catholic nobility of Poland gave our religious forebears, called Socinians, gave them a choice. Either keep your faith and leave this land, leave Poland, or keep your land and give up your faith. And it was those brave souls. Watch the sound. Well, someone will have to do something. <laughs> I'll try to project. I'm pretty good. We got you back. It was those brave souls, mostly women, by the way, who chose to keep their faith and emigrate to Transylvania where they were welcomed and thereby saved Unitarianism for us today. So let's talk a bit about immigration. There are 11 and a half million undocumented immigrants living in this country out of a total population of 311 million. That's about three and a half percent. And why are they here? Some of them, a few of them, are here to escape torture and persecution in their home countries, but the vast majority of them are here to pursue economic opportunity. Well, you're just going to have to stay with me. And why do they come here to pursue economic opportunity? Because large American industries need their labor and employ them in order to keep production costs low, and because there is inadequate economic opportunity in their home countries. Do we imagine that if Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras were economically robust states, do we imagine that their citizens would leave their families, turn their backs on their cultures, risk their lives crossing a desert? Some would, I guess, but the vast majority would not. And why are those countries not economically robust states? The answer is very complicated, but the bottom line is that the economic disparity between North and South is enormous. This is not just the fault of the United States. It is certainly true that American corporations, beginning with United Fruit in Guatemala in 1901, took enormous advantage of Latin American workers it is also true that by removing tariffs under NAFTA, the United States subsidized U.S. products that have flooded the Mexican market, thereby forcing down profits and throwing millions off land. All that is true, but the U.S. is but the biggest player in a worldwide system of inequity. The problem is not the U.S.'s response to that and that the problem now is the U.S.'s response not just to immigration but to economic inequity. For instead of seeking to alleviate it, we punish its victims despite the fact that we will need more and more immigrants in this country if the United States with our declining birth rate is to maintain its competitiveness in the world. I'm going to give you just one astonishing statistic. For every 6% increase in the number of immigrants in this country, 
there is a corresponding 1% increase in the number of registered American patents. Now, what does that tell us? It tells us that we are dependent upon immigration for the health, the creativity of this country. But instead of welcoming these new Americans, we practice what I would call economic entrapment. You are familiar with the legal concept of entrapment, in which a person is induced to commit a crime they would otherwise have been unlikely to commit. And you know that entrapment is illegal. There's no question that being in this country without legal documentation is a crime. A misdemeanor, but a crime nonetheless. There is no question but what governments have a right to control their borders. The problem is that by suborning those economic disparities in the world, particularly in relationship to Latin America, by maintaining the lowest amount of foreign aid as a percentage of GDP of any industrialized country in the world, by enticing foreign workers to take jobs, such as in those poultry factories I mentioned, that most of our own citizens don't want, by failing to provide a workable avenue to the achievement of legal status, the US is playing a game of economic entrapment. And when immigrants fall into that trap, they are ostracized, prosecuted, deported, regardless of their work records, and sometimes regardless of their family ties and obligations in this country. This hardly seems very hospitable, or very fair, or very smart. Now, I want to warn us against demonizing those who support steps to crack down on undocumented immigrants. I know that some of those have supported draconian laws against immigrants in Arizona or Alabama. Some of the supporters are motivated by racism, but many of them are motivated by fear. Right. It may be difficult for some of us Unitarian Universalists, you may not believe this, but Unitarian Universalists have the third highest per capita income of any religious group in America. And it may be difficult for some of us to understand the stress, the terror, that economic hardship inflicts on human beings. And times are very tough still. Not being able to provide for your family or feel secure about your future leads even the strongest people to wilt and to blame. And who is an easier target of blame than those who are outcasts, different, foreign, strangers? The fact that undocumented workers are in fact not taking jobs from citizens, <coughs> that most of the jobs they have are not jobs that our citizens want. That's an inconvenient truth when I am feeling that I am failing my family and that I am worth less and less as a person. What? So, what should we do? We should support undocumented families when they're being ostracized, when their families are being ripped apart. We should oppose laws that make the problem worse. We should reach out to those with whom we disagree. And we should support comprehensive immigration reform and more equitable international economic policies. And most of all, we should practice our age-old passion of offering hospitality to the stranger. This is not an easy thing to do, by the way. Some evolutionary biologists might even argue that it is evolutionarily maladaptive, that it goes against the grain of our self-interest. But then the truth is that human beings have a brain and a heart for a reason. That's right. In her magnificent essay, The Moral Necessity of Metaphor, the novelist Cynthia Ozick quotes this passage from the book of Leviticus, chapter 19. The stranger that sojourneth with you shall be unto you like a homeborn among you. And you shall love the stranger as yourself because you too were once a stranger in the land of Egypt. And Ozick goes on to say that it is because at some point in every one of our lives, each one of us felt somehow like a stranger yep. in the land of Egypt. It is because of that that we can identify with another's pain. 
that in Ozick's words, doctors have the capacity to imagine what it is to be a patient. Those who have no pain at the moment can imagine what it is to suffer. Those at the center of power can imagine what it is to be outside the circle of power. The strong can imagine what it is to be weak, and we strangers can imagine the hearts of other strangers. I've never been tortured. I've never been amputated, never had a hand or an arm amputated, but I know plenty of people who have, and I am compelled by my religious faith to make a metaphorical leap from my own trivial sufferings into the hearts of strangers. And what have I always found there? Astonishing. Always found just one thing. Familiarity. Familiarity. In the heart of every stranger. So the second great passion of Unitarian Universalism's generous heart is its insistence that what we share is far more important and what divides us, and that all blood flows red, even the blood of my enemies. Now, that is truly, that is a radical proposition, that my enemies, too, can bleed. That's our faith. This religious movement has preached that message for more than 400 years. And in the face of anti-immigrant sentiment, to say nothing of rabid nationalism and misplaced patriotism, and religious extremism of all stripes, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, it is a message that is needed now more than ever. Right. Yes. Right on. And, right on. And then there's a third passion that never dies, and that is our passion for hope. Universalism was, after all, born on the conviction that people should be given hope, not hell. What does that mean today? When I was at Amnesty International, the question I was asked repeatedly for 12 years was this. Given all the horror and carnage that you encounter in your work every day, torture, rape, murder, how do you retain any sense of optimism, of hope, about human nature and the human future? Now, I want to begin to answer that question by acknowledging very directly the case against hope. The truth is that the world is full of endless folly and enervating <laughs> evil. I don't need to convince you of that. I don't even need to give you examples of that. The human race may well render the planet uninhabitable. Human beings harm each other grievously. Hope does not always win. Justice does not always prevail. But when we consider the broader human enterprise, the shape of history, I think I can make a 60-40 case for hope. <laughs> a 60-40 case for the possibility that the human spirit is not inevitably tainted by ignorance and ignominy. Right. I was ordained 37 years ago this November. And what Cardinal John Patrick Foley's mother said of him might well be said of me. Cardinal Foley. Cardinal Foley grew up in Connecticut, but he was for many years the chief spokesperson for the Vatican and a connoisseur of Italian food. And when he returned to the United States after several years in Rome, his mother took one look at him and said, John, there are 20 pounds of you that were not ordained. <laughs> I'm interested not in how my girth has changed in 37 years, but in how the world has. 37 years, not a long time in human history. In 1975, about a third of the countries in the world were democratic. Today, more than three quarters of the world's countries are at least putative democracies. In 1975, there were 19 women in the United States Congress. Today there are 98. Still not enough, but better than 19. In 1975, the vast majority of countries in the world practiced the death penalty. Today, a shrinking minority does. 
1975, there was no international mechanism to bring to justice any of the world's great tyrants. A month ago, the International Criminal Court convicted its first defendant, and yesterday, the court for Sierra Leone convicted one of the most brutal tyrants in the world, Charles Taylor of Liberia. Mm. Yes. In 1975, Nelson Mandela was in prison. The Soviet Empire appeared to be impregnable. No one had ever heard of Aung San Suu Kyi of Burma. And the internet, with its capacity to endow the grassroots with remarkable power, was not even, even a gleam in a technological eye. So how did these things, and many others I could mention, how did they change and change for the better? Drew Kennedy sitting here will remember that when I was in theological school at Meadville Lombard, I wore the most horrific pair of turquoise paisley pants every day for four years. Yes, he did! <laughs> I wore them proudly, without embarrassment. I was the envy of the University of Chicago campus. Drew offered me $450 for those pants. <laughs> but why is it that not a single graduate student in the United States would be caught dead wearing those pants today? It's because fashion norms change. And as norms change in the world, so does the configuration of power. Over the past 37 years, since I was ordained, indeed since the end of World War II, we have seen a radical shift in global norms, a shift in the direction of greater openness to diverse voices, of a more equitable distribution of power. And if Harvard psychologist Steven Pinker is to be believed in his new book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, we have seen a significant diminution of violence. Of course, it's true. It's true that global poverty remains stubbornly unmitigated. It's true that Israelis and Palestinians haunt each other's dreams still. It is true that corporate profits favor the 1%. For after all, as my favorite protest sign of the Occupy movement put it, nobody with four aces asks the dealer to deal again. <laughs> but if we follow the advice of one of the greatest philosophers of all time, Baruch Spinoza, who said, in effect, always take the view from eternity. If we take the long view, if we consider that just 250 years ago, a flash in a human eye, 250 years ago, no reputable person in the world would have opposed slavery. 250 years ago, virtually no reputable person in the world would have opposed the subjugation of women. And today, no reputable person would support any of those. If we take this perspective, if we look at human history, not in Aldous Huxley's famous phrase as one damn thing after another, but if we see in it its totality, the pattern there, it is impossible to credibly argue that on balance, humankind has not made enormous progress. Right. Now, could the human race regress? Absolutely and inevitably, it will. We might all go back to wearing turquoise paisley pants. <laughs> progress is not guaranteed. Absolutely not. As the mathematician Freeman Dyson put it, elections are held not to choose the best rulers, but to help us get rid of the worst without bloodshed. <laughs> that, is why, that is why the 19th century Unitarians and the 20th century humanists who preach progress onward and upward forever are seen today as naive. History is not fated or determined to move in any particular direction, good or bad, but thus far, and on balance, the shift in norms and hence in power has been largely in a progressive direction. The radical journalist I.F. Stone put it this way. He said, the only kinds of fights worth fighting are those you will lose. 
because somebody has to fight them and lose and lose and lose again until the day comes when somebody who believes as you do finally wins. <laughs> Give it. Given the growing literacy in the world, <coughs> given the explosion in communications technology, and given the social entrepreneurship that both of those things foster, I bet the odds are in favor of hope by at least 60-40. Right. <laughs> but, but, maybe this is too esoteric to be of comfort. So let me offer you two more reasons for hope in the human enterprise based on my observations about human beings. The first is an observation about human resilience. When the British began trying in earnest to climb Mount Everest, the Tibetans who served as their porters were dumbfounded. The Tibetans, Tibetans have no word for the summit of the mountain. And when they saw the great sacrifices the British were making, losing limbs to frostbite and uh, losing their lives to falls, one of the high lamas said, I felt great compassion for them to suffer so much for such meaningless work. <laughs> one of the great privileges of my life has been to come to know so many people who suffered so much for such important work. What has always astonished me about those I have known who were victims of human rights abuses was that if they survived the death threats or the torture, it was because they never gave up. They endured suffering greater than you and I could ever imagine. They sustained deep wounds, often scarred for life, both physically and emotionally. But time after time, they were prepared to be re-engaged in the struggle for justice. What kind of stubbornness, what kind of devotion does it take to have your two little girls kidnapped by Guatemalan death squad squads, brutally murdered, to not be able 20 years later to speak of them without tears, and yet to become one of the most outspoken advocates for other people's human rights. That's the story of one of my most effective staff members at Amnesty International. Amen. Nick Yaris spent 23 years in prison for a murder he did not commit. And when he was released, I asked him how he felt. And this is the stunning answer that Nick Yaris gave. What are my choices, he said. I could be really devastated and angry and let them continue to own me, or I could have fun. <laughs> Having fun sounds better. <laughs> the lowest insult would be if I came out destroyed, a broken man, a bad man. My survival technique is to become a good man. Perez Aguirre was tortured mercilessly in South American prisons. And many years later, walking along the street, he ran into the man who had tortured him. The torturer was now among those who were being prosecuted, and he tried to avoid Aguirre's gaze. But Aguirre took the initiative. How are you? He asked his torturer. The man said he was very depressed. There was a long pause, and then Aguirre said, if you need anything, come to see me. And then he said, shake hands, friend. I forgive you. The resilience of the human spirit is so profound that I would be guilty of the worst form of narcissism if I gave up hope in human transformation when so many others who have seen humanity at its worst have managed not to. But of course, heroes and heroines like these are very rare. Few of us display that kind of resilience in the face of agony. But what large numbers of us are capable of feeling is another's pain. If resilience is unusual, generosity is commonplace. A few months after the horrendous genocide in Rwanda in 1994, 
a team of so-called reconciliation experts went to that tattered country to help the Tutsis, 800,000 of whom had just been slaughtered by members of the ethnic Hutu tribe, to help the Tutsis begin the process of healing and forgiveness. And for several hours, the experts conducted their training, inviting members of the different tribes to share their feelings with one another. But finally, one of the village elders said, you know, all this is good, but what we really need in this village is a bus. <laughs> the reconciliation experts were taken aback. Yes, they said, perhaps the village does need a bus. Yes, but we're, we're here to talk about far more serious things than a bus. But the elder persisted. We need a bus, he said. And soon all the villagers were chanting, a bus, a bus, a bus. And finally, one of the women in the group explained. We need a bus, she said, that will start its route in the Hutu part of the region, and then drive to the Pygmy part, and then to the Tutsi part, and then back again. And we want the design of the bus seats to be so that all seats face each other. Mm -hmm. And we want to have a rule that no one may sit beside a person from their own tribe. And we want to have conductors that one day are Hutu, and the next day are Pygmy, and the next day are Tutsi. And by the way, we want all the conductors to be women. <laughs> I know, many of those who commit the most horrible crimes suffer no remorse. Psalm 137, verse 9, happy are those who seize your children and smash them against a rock. Believe me, I know, I've seen it. I think it was Heinrich Himmler who said, it was a terrible thing we had to do, killing people every day and then going home to our families. We're the ones you should feel sorry for. <clears throat> yes, I know. But far, far more people, far more, are touched by the sight of the injured, moved by the fate of the fallen, and prepared, at least when their leaders be wise and their laws be just, to extend their hands to the helpless and their hearts to the hopeless. And we need not be among the hopeless, my friends, for the sweep of history right. carries with it the promise of our redemption. Powered as it is, sustained as it is, by both the uncanny and the commonplace, by both resilience and compassion, those are the reasons for hope. This is the third and final passion that will never die. What we need, you see, is a bus. Mm. A bus. Mm. So these three gifts of a generous heart, these three passions that will never die, they signal how critical Unitarian Universalist faith is to the future of the world. A conviction that truth takes many forms. A recognition that what human beings share in common is far greater than what divides us. A certainty that our lives are not in the hands of an inexorable fate or an angry God, but are waiting to be shaped by our hopeful benevolence, our hopeful hands. If I learned anything in the 12 years I was at Amnesty, it is this, that no authentic person, no authentic person can live in this world unmoved by how immense is the tragedy that is creation. No pretty words can cover it up. No simple faith can fix it. No complex theology can explain it away. It just is. Truly religious people know that, fear it, flee it, but do their best to face it. For they know, we Unitarian Universalists know, that our job is not to deny the reality of evil or heartache or death, but to keep companion with them at the same time that we keep companion with blessings and possibility and grace, losing our faith every single night and gaining it again with the coming of the day.
That's what happened to me almost every day at Amnesty. Mm. I lost my faith at night. Mm. And fortunately, I gained it back with the coming of the day. That's just the way it is with us human beings, flawed and fragile as we be. I was often tempted to wish it was otherwise, often <coughs> tempted to never hear another story of torture, to never learn of another senseless killing, to never see tears again. But whenever I wished for such a state of calm, I reminded myself of just one thing, that in the ancient world, a poetry contest was held each year and the third place winner was presented a rose made out of silver. The second place winner, a rose made out of gold. But the first place winner received a real rose, a living rose, that while it was far from perfect and didn't live forever, spoke while it did of art and beauty and power and passion. And who among us, my friend, who among us, if we had to choose, would not choose the living rose? The living rose. Amen. Yes, and, and uh, after we take 15 minutes or so questions, we have a, a couple of my books in the back. They're a little out of date, but uh, there's truth still there. <laughs> and, uh, I'd be glad to sign them, uh, which will increase their value on Amazon immensely. When you <laughs> it is a humbling experience, as I've sometimes done, to go on Amazon and to buy back your own books with inscriptions in them. <laughs> To Drew, my best friend. $4.95. <laughs> so, uh, questions. Uh, I, you know, those of us in the clergy, a number of clergy here tonight, were taught in theological school to respond to any question whether we know anything or not. <laughs> so, feel free to ask me anything except about the Bruins. <laughs> yes, Neil. Uh, so, Bill, if we're in third place among religions in average income, what is your best knowledge or guess as to what place we are in supporting what we believe? Well, thank you, Neil. Neil. <laughs> what, what are the issues behind whether we're really good or we're not really good? <laughs> well, uh, Neil, of course, as you know, is our annual program fund uh, representative and uh, certainly one of our most voracious supporters of uh, both the UUA and the Service Committee. Uh, it's, it's, we're way low on that, on that list. It won't surprise you to know, Neil. Uh, we're a bunch of uh, anti-institutionalists trying to support institutions, and it's, uh, it's a tough, tough thing to do. But uh, at least at the service committee, I, I'm not, I don't know about the UUA, at least in the service committee we're doing, we're doing very well, actually. People are stepping up. As I said, it is a new day there. We have a lot of excitement going on there, and uh, we're, we're doing uh, quite well. Uh, what else is of interest to you? Yes. If Stand I want to take shot. the whole congregation to Haiti, how do I do that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure we can... Accommodate your whole congregation. It's a hundred people. Well, uh, we take about 12 to 15 people at a time. Uh, we take folks to Haiti. Uh, we've been taking them about every uh, six to eight weeks. A delegation uh, to go to uh, fly to Port-au-Prince, 
go in uh, to the Central Plateau, which is about a four-hour drive, or a bit of a rough drive. I've done it, but uh, once you get there, you have luxurious accommodations. Uh, and for seven days, you work your asses off uh, planting trees and building houses. So it's, a, it's a great experience if you're, uh, if you're willing to commit your lives for one week to uh, a great passion. And uh, we intend, over the course of the next year, uh, to begin offering many other opportunities in Guatemala, in India, and here in this country as well, uh, for congregations, for young people, for seminarians. We want, I, I will say part of my motivation in supporting this effort, and I also applaud uh, Peter Morales and the UUA for doing this with us. When I was at Amnesty, Amnesty has one of its most effective uh, programs, is a high school and college program, and I was on college campuses regularly, and, Almost inevitably, uh, I, I, some young person would raise their hand and they would say, Bill, uh, I grew up Unitarian Universalist and uh, I, I've got a summer uh, coming up and I'd like to do some social justice project with Unitarian Universalism. What can I do? And I'd say, no, I, I, don't, I don't think there is any. I don't know. I, there isn't anything. Well, that made me sick. And I want to make sure that every Unitarian Universalist young person who wants to put their faith to work in the world has an opportunity to do so under a Unitarian Universalist banner. Yeah. Amen. And all of it. <laughs> yes, way in the back. Uh, Bill, on that score, maybe you could talk about your vision for the new UU College for Social Justice. Well, that's exactly what I'm saying. That is, that's, that is the vision. The vision for the UU College of Social Justice, which is a joint UUA, UUSC effort, is that within uh, another year or two, we will have the capacity to bring at least a thousand Unitarian Universalists with us around the world to put their faith in action. Another piece of the college uh, is that we want to help every congregation that wants help with discerning how it can be involved in social justice, be it in your own local community, nationally or internationally, to help you figure out how most effectively to do that, whether you do it with UUSC programming in the UUA or not. So we see the college as a way to really transform and energize our Unitarian Universalist movement in terms of its hands-on commitment to social justice. What else is of interest to you? Yes. I'm also interested in the UUUNO yes. group that I think is looking at worldwide social sure. justice. And I'm curious how the relationship is between these various social justice organizations. Right. And well, the question is about the Unitarian Universalist United Nations office and its connection with other UU entities. Uh, let, me, let me explain something to you. Many people are confused about this. The UUA and the UUSC are completely independent organizations mm -hmm. in this sense. When you give money to support the UUA, not one penny of that goes to the UUSC and vice versa. Two separate governing boards. These organizations have followed parallel paths for far too long, in my opinion. And one of the most exciting things about the College of Social Justice is that those paths are now converging. The UU United Nations office has, until very recently, been a separate entity altogether from either one of those organizations, struggled to support itself. Just this past year or so, President Morales has merged the UN office back into the UUA, where it originally sat about 25 years ago. And my hope is that the UN office also will be, now that it's part of the UUA, will be part of this joint effort. There are no doubt many ways in which the UN office can offer College of Social Justice opportunities as well. Yes? Please share your thoughts about the uh, 99%. What in particular? I don't know, just whatever comes to your mind. <laughs> 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 whatever comes to my mind about the 99%, I'll tell you what comes to my mind is the 99% needs to get its ass act together. Yes. Okay. And that's the basic. Um, and um, I, I have to say, I was, I, 
from the beginning was deeply, deeply disappointed in the Occupy. But I'm going to tell you a story. When I, when I was at Oberlin College as an undergraduate, the major political cause, of course, was the anti-Vietnam War movement. And at Oberlin, it took the focus of opposition to having military recruiters on college campus. And one day, a military recruiter drove on into the little town of Oberlin, Ohio, and was immediately, his car was surrounded by about 25 students. And there was a standoff in the middle of the street for one hour, two hours, and after about three hours, the recruiter rolled down his window and he said, I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and the students debated for about another 20 minutes whether to let him go to the bathroom. And by a vote of a, a divided vote of about 17 to 14, they voted yes. He could go to the bathroom and he promised to return to captivity. <laughs> so the recruiter got out of the car. I hope, presume he went to the bathroom, and then, of course, he went immediately to the recruiting table at the college administration building. And after a few minutes, these students, the students, words started to be passed. The college recruiter, the, the military recruiter is in the, he didn't come back. He lied. <laughs> and I said to myself, I was watching all of this with amusement, and I said to myself, here is a military recruiter who represents in the eyes of the students the very worst of human nature, who is a symbol of napalm being dropped on the Vietnamese, who is a symbol of evil in its form, and you idiots thought that he would keep a promise and return to captivity? He's not nuts. Now, what does this have to do with the occupant? The fact is that the students had no plan. They had no plan for what to do with that car or that recruiter other than to surround it. They had no plan and no organization. And so when the facts of life, literally, inserted themselves, they had no idea what to do. That's right. And that's exactly what tragically we've seen. And I'll tell you this, you know the name of the, the, the Koch brothers, is it Koch or Koch? Koch. 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 And cocaine. Koch. 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 These are very, very smart people who understand organizing. And one of the smartest things that the brother Charles said, quoted in the New Yorker a few months ago, is we understood that to change this country, you have to change it on five or six different levels at the same time. You have to litigate. You have to legislate. You have to organize at the grassroots. You have to elect sympathetic candidates. You can't change the country in just one way. You've got to change it consistently and in a comprehensive way. That's right. That's what the Tea Party knew, maybe still does. And that's what the Occupy movement did not do and did not. So it's not over yet. Well, general strike Tuesday. Well, all right. Yeah, we'll see how many people come out for the general strike. Understand Tuesday. that? Okay, that's fine. Have faith, faith, brother. That's fine. <laughs> faith, have faith and organize. There you go. Isn't that what Ronald Reagan said? <laughs> Trust but verify. Have faith but organize. That's not good, right? and that's Big what Bill Hayes. Okay, one more question, Drew. Can you shout? Use your preacher voice so everyone can hear you. I'm concerned about reproductive freedom uh -huh. and what appears yeah. to me to be an erosion of reproductive freedom. Yeah. What's, what's your view about that and what should be done? There, there is absolutely no, look, look, here, here is how social change works. There's no question that reproductive freedom and many other uh, <laughs> issues with regard to women's rights are in, in, in significant jeopardy. Now, this is how social change works. This is how you create a virtuous circle. First, a often small group of people begins to shift social norms. And when those norms are shifted sufficiently, then the laws begin to change. And when those laws change, if the movement to support the change in norms is strong and well organized and effective, then the laws are reinforced by people who see themselves as law-abiding people. And if they're not, the laws deteriorate. And 
those who are opposed to those laws on whatever grounds have a new opportunity to insert themselves into the circle. And that's exactly what we're seeing happening now. But this is the story of all social change. This is the story of, of uh, every social movement that it is not enough to believe that when the laws have changed, the battle is over. It's just not true. Mm -hmm. And particularly in those cases where the laws are changed through the courts and not through yeah. the legislation. Yeah. The legislature. Mm -hmm. Now, this is, this is, by the way, exactly why those who are opposed to the gender equality movement are so uh, frightened of the legislature's of this decision being made in the legislatures or in the voting box, because they know that as those norms change and as the laws change with them, what will happen is that people will gradually realize, well, you know, I mean, this isn't really a threat to my traditional marriage. And uh, those arguments will fade away. But if those norms, if we don't keep working at the change of those norms, even if the laws change, then that too will be in danger of reversion. So that's our job. We don't need a majority, by the way, to change the world. The trim tab factor, keep that in mind. In the middle of the Vietnam War, a little book was published called The Trim Tab Factor. And now, unless you're a boat designer, you don't know what a trim tab is. I certainly we all know that a rudder changes the direction of a boat, but a trim tab is a little doohickey attached to the rudder that changes the direction of the rudder. And the point of this book was that it never takes a majority to change the world. It only takes a smart, well-organized minority, persistent, well-organized, obnoxious minority. That's what I.F. Stone was saying, was saying. You need people to lose and lose and lose and lose again until finally somebody believes like you win. But then you have to keep pushing and keep winning to move from the tim trim tab, that modest number, to uh, a majority that is sustainable. You know, almost until the end of the Vietnam War, a uh, majority of Americans supported the war and said it was a good idea. Uh, but the war ended, and it ended because of that trim tab. Okay, folks, I'm sure uh, you're tired. I certainly am. But I'm more than happy to sign books for you in the back there. And uh, it's just been great to be with you and have a great meeting. All right, thank you.